What are some of the latest advances in treatment failures and relapse in AML? I think it's simply tremendous that just in the last three years, we've had some approvals uh, based on understanding of the disease biology. So for example, you get approval in relapse refractory AML uh, that is IDH2 mutated for inacidinib. You uh, also have a very similar approval for the same refractory patient population uh, with IDH1 mutants for ibocidinib. Um, you get relapsed the refractory FLIS3 mutant AML approval for giltritinib. And um, it's, it's kind of a proof of concept that maybe we are getting into this stage where understanding the disease biology will result in improved therapy. So what I see, especially moving forward, is a variety of clinical trials that have a backbone, especially in the elderly population where the challenge is actually more formidable because they, the responses are low and they can't go for transplant. Uh, although a subset that was treated with uh, ven and aza, uh, venetoclax and azacitidine was able to actually undergo curative therapy. So now we're talking about doublets and triplets, which is kind of interesting, like in the this new era of AML treatment. So um, I think more to come on this in the next few years. And it's, it's a very exciting time to um, participate in, in clinical trials that treat patients according to their personalized uh, AML type. Uh, it's no longer just one size fits all. And we need to um, uh, treat those diseases based upon their own characteristics. And hopefully over the next three years, we will have few more uh, approvals for drugs that will make patients' lives um, better. Dr. Signe, do you want to comment on how you see the next few, um, perhaps the next decade unfold relative to uh, advances in treatment failure and relapse? Yeah, so, so there the, are the, the three phases to look at it in, as far as the treatment that we use um, in the classical way of treating AML with the induction treatment, the consolidation treatment, and the maintenance. And so each, and then for patient, the relapse patient. So I think you've highlighted the major features, you know, the importance of understanding the underlying mechanism or mutations that are driving the leukemia. So we can come up with targeted treatment. And if you're looking at, you know, the FLIP3 mutations in itself, we know that even with one agent, that's the best one we can choose, that we're still going to see relapses. And so we have two other agents that are uh, the gilteritinib and, 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 and then the crizotinib. We need more um, in a way to try and work out wh what's the best way of treating a patient. What drug do we use first? What drug do we use second and third, for instance? And in what combination? So again, this points out to the importance of the participating in studies. We have there are other new promising agents that are coming along. And it, I'm going to mention one that, that seems to be very important, and that's the Magrolimab, which is a, a drug that works against CD47. It's in clinical studies at the moment. And we haven't talked about one mutation that has a bad connotation in a way. It's the TP53 mutation. And this mutation is often present on chromosomes. It's, it's, a, it's, it's on, this gene is present on chromosome 17. And so one may detect abnormalities when on doing the chromosomal studies involving the 17 in the specific place or position on the chromosome, which I, I won't go into. But if we find TP53 mutation, which occurs in about 10% of patients 
with AML, especially at diagnosis, around diagnosis. So it's not a mutation that's present at diagnosis in, in the majority of patients, but it's a mutation that may happen over time. So um, especially when they fail, a, a, a patient fails a treatment and gets an evolution of a drug, uh, uh, of the leukemia uh, with a new mutation, th this mutation is not infrequently involved. And when it happens, it makes the disease more resistant. So it's important to try and find drugs that work, especially for this mutation, for instance. I'm just using this as an example of where we need to go. Um, to try and do much better uh, in controlling patients who have this mutation. And even um, transplantation is not the answer for these patients because they still relapse despite undergoing a transplant. So we have to do better for these patients and, and uh, participate in studies, come up with new drugs. There was a, a drug that came out of Sweden that um, was be, uh, uh, had a, a high hopes, but um, the, the results aren't showing as ho uh, hopeful an outcome as we all were, were wishing for. So again, we have to try and find the drugs that work specifically for these different mutations. So I just mentioned that TP53 mutation because it is a big thorn in the physician side in trying to 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 do better for the patients. And certainly it's a, it's a bad um, in mutation to have um, for for the patient. So just to, to mention some of the, 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 what we have to do. And you mentioned already, uh, doublets, two drugs are probably going to be better than one, but not always. A, a combination of two drugs may mean that they're more bad side effects um, and maybe not that better an outcome as far as controlling the disease. We have to test that to find out whether we should use that combination or not. So uh, of two drugs. And then again, you mentioned the triplets, the three drug combinations that will be used in certain uh, disorders and the FLT3 mutation with mitostorin and the intensive chemotherapy is a great example of the improvement in outcomes that we've seen with patients with the FLT3 mutations.